All right, now you know this is new content for the fifth test, right? Yes. Y'all have already had your content for the fourth test, which is coming up Tuesday. All right. The EAQs will open at 3 o'clock this afternoon for immunity. 3 o'clock. Don't look for them falling because they ain't there yet. Okay? 3 o'clock. All right. <clears throat> You've got several chapters in your book that relates to level two immunity. You will have immunity in level two, three, and four. In level two, you're going to get some basic information about immunity and kind of what you're going to see as you move forward. So you're kind of building on this. Now, we have concepts that relate to immunity. You all realize that you have a concept PowerPoint that's on Canvas for you to listen to. And I would encourage you to listen to that because you know your questions are application questions. And if you understand a concept, then you can better answer any question that relates to that concept. If you try to just memorize stuff, then that doesn't work as well on these level two tests, does it? We don't give memorization type questions because you're not going to see that on NCLEX. You're going to see application questions so that you apply that knowledge that you have to a situation or to a question. What would a nurse do? Okay? Now, the concepts that we have for immunity, I just want to go over these because within, for the immunity section, that concept PowerPoint is important for you to, to listen to and understand. That'll help you with the test. All right, first of all, immunity is a concept. Inflammation, infection, tissue integrity, nutrition, stress, and fatigue. All of those are concepts, and it's on your, your syllabus, it's on your objectives, okay? So you, like I said, just kind of go back and, and listen to that PowerPoint and get yourself kind of thinking in terms of concept. All right, so our unit objectives that we're going to be dealing with today is uh, you're going to be probably, you, you all realize by now, who did that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And some kind of jam. I don't know what kind of jam. Okay. Scuffing on jelly. Scuffing. Oh, okay. I just wondered about the teachers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure what was in that jar, to be honest with you. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. I just, I, that would have worried me if I hadn't asked. <laughs> okay. Moving right along. Um, you all are going to have to know how to do a good assessment. All right? And the first objective speaks to that. Perform a focused assessment that should be included when collecting data on adults and older adults who have an alteration in immunity. All right, y'all realize that on your objective, it tells you the population that you all are going to be looking at. And here it talks about adults and older adults. When you get to maternal child, you may have some younger adults in that, right? But right now, we're talking about adults and older adults. And we're going to look at their health history, do a physical assessment, look at vital signs in any labs and things like that in doing our assessment and gathering data. The second one has to do with applying your knowledge of anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology, nutrition, any kind of developmental variations that helps us to care for people who are adults or older adults that have an alteration in immunity. Y'all kind of know how these objectives work now, right? Okay, I just, I, but I have an obligation to make sure you understand what you're faced with as far as knowledge. <coughs> Identify priority actions for adults and older adults who have an alteration in immunity. <coughs> do you all not get priority questions? Yes, you do. And these objectives are telling you that you've got to know how to, what comes first, what's the most important, okay? Remember, all those answers on your exams are correct. You just got to pick the best one that 
success is the priority of what you do first for this person. Okay? That's where that comes from. Applying knowledge of the actions, potential side effects, and nursing implications when administering medications to the adults and older adults. Older adults. So that's where your medications comes in. You all are going to have some questions that deal with medications. The next one talks about recognizing alterations in pulse oximetry, other lab values as it relates to immunity, and some they give us here that we need to talk about is CBC, ANA, ESR, CD4, EIA, Western blot, the RH factor, which stands for rheumatoid factor, not RH negative, okay, this is rheumatoid and immunity, and immunoglobulin. So you're going to have to know something about those. The next one says discuss the correct use and functioning of therapeutic devices that support immunity. And as we go through the different conditions, then we'll talk about maybe some devices that might be needed to help these folks to move along with that condition. Describe the role of the nurse in providing quality care to adults and older adults. All right, how are you going to care for these patients? What's your responsibility? What's your role? The eighth one says to identify health education. So do you all get questions that relate to which one of these indicates that person needs more help, additional information, additional teaching, right? Mm -hmm. Or which one indicates that they know something? Y'all get that? Mm -hmm. So that's where that comes from. And you also have to have some safety issues in here, safety questions. All right. So that's the objectives there. Now the content that we're going to cover today has to do with autoimmune disorders such as Guillain-Barre, y'all talked about that in cognition, I know you have, myasthenia gravis. We're going to talk about SLE or systemic lupus erythematosus, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, and scleroderma. I'll mention all those today, all right? And when you get to level three, we'll expound on those and add to you. The next thing we're going to talk about is HIV AIDS. we will mention that. We're going to talk about organ transplant. And on your um, content here, it says SCID. We mark it through that. That's severe combined immunodeficiency, which we will talk about in level four. So that gets to be off of that. The next one has to do with pathophysiology as it relates to hypersensitivity or reactions such as allergies, anaphylaxis. We're going to mention that today. Then some meds that you're going to be responsible for. Corticosteroids. I hope that y'all can make you a med card on corticosteroids and remember that forever. Because that's in just about every content, is it not? Okay. Then we're going to talk about antihistamine because we're going to talk about allergies or allergic reactions. Right? That makes sense? Then we're going to talk about the HIV AIDS drugs, the antiretroviral drugs, all right? That's the three categories of meds that you need to know. Now, I'll kind of tell you more as we go. Then you're going to need to know two kinds of diets. You need to know the nutritional one for HIV AIDS, which would be high calorie, high protein. And then you need to know the one for gout, which is a low purine diet. Now, everything I just told y'all right there, right? And we're going to test based on these objectives and this content. Any questions up to this point? And don't tell me you could have read this because you wouldn't, okay? And the thing is, I know that. Because most of you didn't watch your videos for the skill thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I love you, Minor. Good for you. I'm proud of you. But I know some of you didn't. 
And, you know, I have an obligation to make sure that I go over what you are responsible for. And I have done that. And I hope y'all paid attention and didn't sleep. Okay? Yeah. All right. Let me tell you what we're going to do today. I'm not talking for four hours. I'm just not. All right. I got 20 topics that we're going to cover. 20. All right? And you're going to help me with that. If you don't, don't come tell me about, oh, I didn't make it on that day. Okay? Because you got to pay attention and you got to participate in order to get something out of it. Right? So what we're going to do, let's see, how many of y'all is it? 64. 64? <laughs> Can you divide three into that? One's gonna, 21 and a half. 21 and a half? Or a quarter. Can you cut them up? Yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you what. So one group's going to have four. Okay, I need 20 groups. I need 20 groups. So how are we going to do that, guys? We have 64 in here? Well, there's some people not here just yet, but they probably will come at break. You know what I'm saying? But, um... Yeah, three Probably in each group, but then three groups will have. 20 groups of three. We'll start with that. All right? I want y'all to decide who y'all want to be partnered up with. Okay? Three of you. Okay? Getting part, getting groups of three. I don't care how y'all do it. Can we need just four right here? Because we need four in the group anyway. Yeah, I'd be all right. Since you spoke first. Okay? All right, y'all, this is what we're going to do. I have taken the syllabus, which I read. All right? And I took and wrote out 20 topics that's on your syllabus that you need to know. All right? Now, you don't need to know everything about everything, but you need to know some things about some things. <laughs> So, what I would like for you to do is I'll go around, y'all decide how your group's going to be. You can, you can do whatever you need to do with these tables to put them together because you're going to put your information, which you can gather, y'all, this is what you can do now to make it easy on yourselves. You can get together with your content, get your information, and then you'll come up here and put it on one of these poster boards. And then we'll stick them on the wall. And y'all can snapshot them to death. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I want to make a group of four right here. But y'all got to do the work. Because if I do it, it ain't going to hit. All right? So y'all got to do it. So I want you to decide, like I say, if y'all want to move your desks together, chairs the opposite, I don't care what you do with them. As long as they go back in this, this way, when we leave. <laughs> huh? Can we be a group of four too as well? I'm going to tell y'all something now. I got 20 copies, and I got to give out 20 copies. We'll do two if you want. Okay. I'm all right with that as long as everybody gets a copy and everybody participates. All right, let me give you my further instructions. All right, I know this is taking a little bit, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We get this done. You know, communication up front is what's important. All right. I'm going to come around and give everybody a topic. Okay? And then we're going to go over these a little bit later, one at a time. I want you on your research. What I need you to do, I mean, these papers are all so big, okay? Mm -hmm. But I need you to put down at least five key points about your topic and if you need me to kind of lead you in a direction that'll be fine and then as we go over these I'll fill in the blanks Is that fair enough okay so if you will go ahead and get in your, your groups and then I'll come around and give you your assignments feel free 
to take your screenshots or whatever you do with your phone and study. Okay? Because obviously the folks that have put these up here have picked out the most important things for you to know. All right? Now we can talk about it as a group, but um, there's a lot of information in here. So you're going to have to spend some time studying and reviewing this, but hopefully we'll cover the key points today. Pay attention. All right, go for it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Hey. <laughs> so we've got amino globulins. First time you got IgA, IgG, IgE, IgG, and IgM. Hopefully somebody will take a picture of that. IgA most responsible for preventing infection in the upper and lower respiratory tracts, the GI tracts, and the genitourinary tract. The IgD present in low blood concentrations in conjunction with IgM. IgE associated with antibody mediated hypersensitivity reactions. IgG has three points, 75% of circulating antibody population. Um, this IgG enhances neutrophil and macrophage actions and long-term immunity against invading microorganisms. IgM has two points. It is especially effective at the antibody action of agglutination and precipitation because of having 10 potential binding sites per molecule and it is also 10 to 15 percent of circulating antibody population. Okay. Yes. Everybody gets a clap. All right. <laughs> All right. Maybe so let, let me just kind of talk to you just a minute about the immunoglobulin. Y'all realize that in in general, what immunity is is our body's way of protecting it from the outside world, right? And we have our skin that will help protect us as well. And when a, an invader, hey. Um, immunoglobulin, that's it's just like the same word as antibody, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. And gamma globulin, too. Gamma globulin, okay? And all antibodies, yes, are immunoglobulins or gamma globulins. Yes, same terminology. I'm just making sure. Yeah, that's correct. Good question. All right, but like I say, you know, we have to have protection from the outside world. And when we get these foreign invaders or antigens, you know, that get inside the body and break the body's barrier, then we have these mechanisms inside our body that help to protect us and kill off those invaders, go through a process called phagocytosis after they're broken down and gobbles them up and gets rid of them, okay? Now, if you want to know more about the anatomy, physiology of that, you're welcome to go in the book and research all that. We just don't have time for that. But we do understand that what happens is that our body does respond to these invaders by building antibodies so that it sensitizes B cells, okay? And up front, y'all realize that we have white blood cells or lymphocytes that helps to fight off these invaders. White blood cells, right? Fights infection, inflammation, what have you. So we, do you know that they, and I may have told you this already, that they are all made in the bone marrow. Cells are made in the bone marrow, okay? And depending on which direction they go, where they mature, they can go in, stay there in the bone marrow and they become B cells. If they go off and travel to the thymus gland, they become T cells, okay? So when we're talking about like the immunoglobulins here, it's when an invader gets into the body and these B cells run up there and say, oh no, we had him, okay? <laughs> So they start trying to fight that invader off, and they become sensitized to that. And so the next time that invader gets in there, then they recognize it quickly, you know, more quickly, because they know it now, and they get rid of it quickly. 
At least that's the way I'm thinking. So we have all these antibodies in our body that helps protect us from all these different areas that they've mentioned here, whether it's in the mucous membranes or where. You know, our body has these antibodies there that's going to come in our defense and help to keep us healthy. So that's what I want you to take away from that. All right? Basically, that our body just has these things. Okay? And so they're going to help protect us. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I really want you to know about that. I want you to kind of understand the antibodies, though. You know, why our body has them. But the main thing here is that these B cells become sensitized next time they see that antigen come in, they can respond quicker. <coughs> All right. The next thing that we're going to talk about is labs that are related to alterations. All right? Um, we're going to talk about a couple of labs. Um, most of them we already kind of know a little bit of something about. Um, your CDC, uh, clearly that has a lot to do with your um, immunity because, you know, we you know like white blood cells, those eat bad stuff, um, has a lot to do with immunity. So know those values. Um, we don't have any of them really written up here. But, um, what does that mean? White blood cell count. Five to ten thousand. Okay. So if it's five to ten thousand, and you've got somebody who is immunocompromised, which means that they may have had some chemotherapy, like we talked about oncology, or maybe they've gotten uh, HIV, and a lot of their um, CD4 counts, which is T cells, they're low so they can't fight infection as much, and they end up getting an infection, and their white blood cell count is really low, then what happens? That disease has a chance to ravage in the body. There's nothing fighting it off. Okay. All right. But just understand, you know, that's why we have white blood cells, you know, is to help us to protect us from the outside world. You mentioned something I'd like to highlight there. Okay. Um, you said CD4, okay. which does everyone know what CD4 is? Because I have no idea. <laughs> well, it's something we need to know, and I want you to remember these numbers. You ready? You remembering these? 500 to 1500 for your CD4. You got that? 500. What is it? Oh, CD4. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, CD4. Oh man, I haven't written here. Look behind me. No, the other way. No, it's over here. Look at the goal. Yeah, that's, that's a normal CD. Yeah. Okay, CD, what is a CD4? It's a cell. Yeah, it's right? just a cell that helps. And it's made in the thymus gland. Okay. I didn't know that. Alright, it's a T cell. Okay? So that five And that's the cell that the HIV virus takes over. Mm -hmm. It takes over the CD4 cells. Yeah, it's specific And makes it into an HIV. So. Okay, so moving right along with CD4. Uh, yeah, CD4, remember that. Um, uh, we Can also I have... elaborate on it in a minute? Wait, what? Can I talk about it in a minute? Yeah, go okay. ahead. Right. Please, <laughs> take over. All right. <laughs> As far as what he just told you all, that you know the normal values that's in your book is 500 to 1500, and that's significant in the fact that when we're talking about HIV or AIDS, which somebody's going to talk about in just a little bit, I just want you to understand that there is some numbers I want you to keep in your mind. Not only the 500 to 1500 is what they consider a normal C4 count. Okay, if a person has less than 500, okay, then they will usually have, when they're diagnosed with HIV, their CD4 count will probably be less than 500, okay, because it won't be normal. It may be for a while, but then after a while, the um, virus takes over more and more of the CD4 cell and that number goes less than 500. So basically the higher the better? Yes. 
the higher the better on CD4 count. All right, you've if you got, have a really low CD4 count, you probably have AIDS. Well, <laughs> one of the criteria, Less and than whoever's talking about HIV AIDS, we could talk, I will go ahead and mention this since we're talking about labs, that if you have a patient, according to CDC guidelines, Center for Disease Control Guidelines, if you have a patient who has a CD4 count that's less than 200, they will probably be given a diagnosis of AIDS. Keeping in mind that everybody that has AIDS has HIV, but not everybody that has HIV has AIDS yet. Okay? But a diagnosis of AIDS includes a 200 or less CD4 count. And most often, an opportunistic infection. Okay, so let's talk about these numbers one more time so I can make sure I cover what I need to with you. Anything less than 500 <clears throat> is a concern. If you have a person that has less than 200, they will probably get a diagnosis of AIDS. Less than 200 is a diagnosis of AIDS. If they have HIV, and they are less than a 350 CD4 count, they will probably put them on medication. Pardon? I'm sorry. Yeah, HIV is, you know, it's done for, we have tests, and he's fixing to talk about them they'll tell you whether they're positive for HIV or not. But if that CD4 count, most of the time, if it's less than 500 regardless, people are getting in trouble. If it's less than 200, they have a diagnosis of AIDS. If it's less than 350, they start looking at putting them on medication for the HIV. 500, 1,500 is a normal count. So at 500, they won't put them on meds? No. They usually put them on meds. They start considering at 350. Now, I can't judge what anybody could do, but that's just a rule of thumb. And the thing is, uh, if they put a person with HIV on meds, they stay on them. They don't get off of them. So they try not to put them on them too soon. Okay? All right, go ahead. Um. <clears throat> Another lab that they will use to help detect um, HIV antibodies is the EIA, which stands for some words that I don't remember right now. But the EIA, it's what they use to like isolate the antibodies that um, HIV attacks, and then they confirm and determine if it's um, HIV or AIDS with the Western blot assay. Assay, is that correct? Um, and that's what they use, that's like the test to say, oh, you've definitely got HIV or AIDS. Um, so the EIA and the Western Blot are two more lab tests. That you probably should know what we mean. Western Blot. Western Blot, A-S-S-A-Y. Western Blot. Y'all remember the EIA, the other name for the EIA is the ELISA. ELISA test. Okay, and they both test for HIV. Well, sort of. Okay, the ELISA test or the EIA is what they will do initially to determine if this person could possibly have HIV virus in their blood. And then what they'll do, as he said, they will turn around and do a Western blot. This is on your syllabus, these labs are. Okay? That's why you need it. So you know what you're studying for. Okay? So the Western blot assay is what they're going to do to confirm the illicit test to give a diagnosis of AIDS. HIV, sorry, HIV. So the simple way to remember it is the EIA detects it and the Western blot like confirms, confirms, confirms. the diagnosis. Um, the next uh, blood test that we have on here is the RH factor. Um, Anybody been tested for the RH factor? Any females, pregnant females? Yeah. 
Did not. I'm gonna sew on the head. Yeah. yeah. It's like when my blood was. Okay. Let me clarify. Let me clarify. We're not talking about the Rh negative positive factor here. We're talking about a rheumatoid factor. Oh. We're in immunity. Okay. And we're talking about the Rh factor here is a rheumatoid factor that they use to detect if a person could possibly have rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. I was wrong. Just to clarify. Well, as, as was, the, uh, the other one, the rhesus factor, that's sort of related to immunity, correct? Uh, not related. Never mind. We won't go there. <laughs> yeah, we go. That was to see if someone has rheumatoid arthritis. I didn't know that. And I mean, uh, it, it lets them know there's more specific tests for rheumatoid arthritis now. They've got a brand new one out that's in your book now that was not in some of the older books. It's called the cyclic central mutilated something peptide. Okay? Something called like that. And it's called CCP, and they are using that to diagnose people for RA. Whereas the RH factor was something that indicated that they had something going on, like maybe an um, autoimmune type disorder. Okay, moving right along. Uh, another term to, uh, to know is the viral load. Um, viral load, it basically determines how much of a virus is in your blood. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I have written down is the C-reactive protein. Um, and all I have, all I know about that is it's like a very quick test <coughs> to see something. Um, yes, it's a quicker, it's a quicker, quicker, ESR, quicker tests than the ESR to like to, to see your inflammatory response to whatever it is. <coughs> and that's all I got. All right. I'm sure, I missed some stuff. Good job. <laughs> I take what I'll do. Everybody does class first. Okay, let me just go over what you said, okay? Just so we can all recoup, make sure we're all on the same page. The test that's listed on your, your syllabus, on your objectives here, is the CBC, and you mentioned that we're really concerned about maybe looking at the white blood cell count, making sure that people that are immunocompromised can fight off of infection. Okay, so that account does not need to be too low, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they could be in trouble. But then again, if it got too high, they could be in trouble, need some antibiotics or whatever for some sort of inflammatory process that maybe got way out of hand. The ANA, the anti-nuclear antibody test, the ESR and the uh, C-reactive protein, all three of those are checking for inflammatory processes in the body. And in this section, we're talking about autoimmune disorders. We talk about HIV, AIDS, transplants, things like that. So all of these things can cause some kind of inflammation to occur. And these are tests that they would normally run to check a person to see if they had inflammation. And you talked about the ELISA test or the EIA test, which talks about detecting those antibodies for HIV, and the Western blot assay test is what they're going to take and do to confirm the EIA, right? Okay. And you also talked about that RH factor, which is a rheumatoid factor that some people have that have rheumatoid arthritis, and now they have, like I say, that more sensitive test that will actually say, yeah, they have rheumatoid arthritis, and that's that CCP, the cyclic, I won't test you on that because it's too neat. Citrullinated peptide. Maybe that's the way you say it. I don't know. And the other is the immunoglobulins that's on your list. And the immunoglobulins is what they talked about here, which are, you know, some of the antibodies that the body makes. And they can measure, you know, these antibodies through labs. And they can tell if you have them or you don't. Okay, and how many you have, and if it's normal. Okay? So that pretty well covers the labs that you're going to be responsible for. All right? Number three is up. Who's number three? 
I guess that's where we're going with that. It's just whatever we can use to, you know, help the patient out, protect the patient, and keep them as um, having better outcomes. You know, keep them as mobile as they can be, as active as they can be. All right, thank you, ma'am. All right. Have a good day. Have a good day. All right okay, we got number four, which uh, is. The hypersensitivity type one reaction. Who uh, yeah. has that? For us, hypersensitivity is a question of allergies. You have, say, a response, inappropriate response, uh, side symptoms to be swollen gland, uh, swollen glands, hives, rash. Pretty much anything, it's like if you're allergic to a dog or something, you go up and start rubbing on everything, and you start welping up everything, that's your body reaction to it. Um, um, right. Right. Okay. Rhinitis. Our seasonal allergies, uh, everybody should know about that one. It's pretty much sneezing, nasal congestion, coughing. Um, <coughs> and then we have anaphylaxis, which is the more severe, life threatening one. That's the one if you. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> I was just getting your attention for you. <laughs> um, you know, it's a life threatening one. Uh, pretty much the treatment problem for the allergies and everything. You just want to teach them to stay away from whatever it is that they have, uh, whatever makes them have a reaction to. With seasonal allergies, normally antihistamines work. Uh, that would be a daily thing. And then for anaphylaxis, they normally have the EpiPen. And sometimes you have um, for steroids, but most of the time it's going to be the EpiPen that's their rescue. And if they get to the hospital, then you'll ID it. What did you say? They get to the hospital, it would be better to go ahead and ID it. It would be quicker. Okay, but for an anaphylaxis, because you'll be swollen up and everything, you're going to get oxygen. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let me, uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Y'all, let's clap for him first. I can bring my bell again. <laughs> okay. Y'all, keep in mind hypersensitivity. There's four of these things that we're just going to be talking about because this is part of our immune system and how it responds to things that are not normal for us. It, our body doesn't respond well to certain things, obviously, that people are allergic to. Now, it can be just irritating or it can be life-threatening, okay, depending on what that sensitivity is, okay? Like he mentioned, you know, you might can be um, just Allergic to what? Dandruff or something? Like dog? Did you say? What did you say? <laughs> to dog. Dog. Dan you know, that stuff. Anyway, uh, you can be allergic to things like that that it just might irritate you and aggravate you, right? But then you might can have an allergic reaction that will stop your airway. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we just need to see the significance of the difference and what you do for that. All right, he said, first of all, if you come in contact with something that you have, an, an, have a hypersensitivity or a reaction to, what's the best treatment for that? Stay away from it. Stay away from it. Okay, right. But, there again, if you maybe never had this reaction before and you find that your airway is closing up, you know what I'm saying? That's pretty serious. You didn't necessarily, you couldn't stay away from that the first time, right? Mm -hmm. But once you do, and you know the next time this happens, that you've got to have an EpiPen with you, because if you don't do something quickly, that airway could close up and you could die. Mm -hmm. Then people carry these EpiPens with them all the time, right? Mm -hmm. All right. A few things I just want you to remember about the EpiPens. All right, first of all, these pens have expiration dates. Mm -hmm. And you have to instruct your, your patients if you're teaching them about how to use an EpiPen, 
So I'd pew into the side of the legs, that kind of stuff, maybe new clothes if they have to, whatever. But on the EpiPen, they need to make sure they have some that, that are current, that are in date. Mm -hmm. First of all, they gotta know how to use them, right? They gotta have them. And check the dates on these things. They need to have a couple of them in case it takes more and more. They need to be on their way to the hospital after they treat themselves or be calling an ambulance or whatever. So they always need to be followed up if they have to use an EpiPen. All right? Um, trying to think if there's anything else on that EpiPen on will keep. If I do, I'll thank them later. Real fast, the hypersensitivity is a response to our outer? It can be through the mouth. I mean, if you do it systemically. Okay, let me give you an example of that that's in your book that I thought was very interesting. And I hope I can repeat this. Uh, I'm not positive. It's in your book if I can. Um, <clears throat> it's like latex. Mm -hmm. Okay? For instance, if uh, somebody is just allergic to it, you know, like putting on the latex gloves mm -hmm. or something, you know, they may can have some uh, contact dermatitis, I think is what it says. Mm -hmm. But if a person's allergic to it and they go to surgery, okay, and somebody might inhale some of this stuff, stuff, then that could get systemic if they inhale. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There's a difference in that dermatitis effect, contact dermatitis, versus inhaling something that would get into the blood and cause a very serious reaction. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Did that kind of answer your question a little bit? Yes, ma'am. Sort of. So it's just our res body's yeah. response for protection. Yeah. And depending on, you know, how, it, you know, what way it causes that yeah. mm -hmm. sensitivity as to how serious that might be. Okay. Okay? Yes, because maybe just touching the skin with it wouldn't cause a problem, but inhaling it might lock you up. Yes. <laughs> okay, you can't breathe. So with the EpiPen, mm -hmm. you stab it in the thigh, right? They usually to the side, yes, of the thigh. Most people will go straight into the thigh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're in an emergency, they'll do their thigh, but most of the time it's like right there. Okay. Hey, you just get it in there. One. If you can't breathe, you just go wherever. I have a friend that loves shrimp, <laughs> and she's allergic to it, so she'll eat shrimp and then stab herself with the Epi. I'm like, I'm not saving your life. Okay, back there. Going back to what he said. You know, the best, the best thing to do if you know you're allergic to something is just stay away from it, right? Okay. We good with that? All right, so number five. We'll do one more and then we'll take a break. All right, number five is the type two hypersensitivity. Now, who has number five? All right. All right, um, type two is the definition of the body makes all of the that I just kind of hit on was basically like um, a person could get the wrong blood, right? And so knowing <laughs> that if, uh, you know, a lot of times when 
this blood is tight and cross matched, right? What do y'all think they're looking for when they do that? Immunity factors. They're looking for things to make sure that these people don't have the one that's given the blood doesn't have certain antibodies that don't match this one that might interact wrong or something. Okay? So they have to type and cross match and make sure that things work together. However, sometimes they don't know that yet, and this person may be fighting off that other blood they're getting and have a reaction to it. As a nurse, now, we've been talking about this one time in um, oncology about what to do if a person starts getting stuff under their skin and going to eat their skin off and all that. What do you do? Stop Same it. thing with the blood transfusion. Stop it. That's right. If a person's getting a blood transfusion and they start having an, a reaction, then what do you do? You stop that infusion, right? Okay. But we're not talking about like dialysis. We're talking about the drip. No, we ain't doing dialysis. Okay. Uh -uh. All right. No, I ain't doing no dialysis. We're going to do just like this says. If you have a blood transfusion and a person starts having a reaction to it, what's your responsibility? Okay, but that is considered a type 2 hypersensitivity. That person was sensitive to something, okay, mm -hmm. and their body responded to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, the first one, they might have been dealing with something like dog hair or whatever, but this one, we're talking about like a blood transfusion or something, you know, like that. That would be. Um, give me some other examples. Would you use other than the transfusion <coughs> reaction? Uh, drug abuse. Drug. Okay. Maybe some kind of hemolytic or blood disorder would be one. Okay. All right, guys. I tell you what. We still got a couple hours for the rest of it. So y'all take you about a ten minute break, and we'll come back.